So, reason and philosophy. It, basically, what Nietzsche is doing here is talking about you know, two ways in which the philosophers more or less have it ass backwards. Right? Um, he starts off uh, with the first in idiosyncrasy. There are two. Uh, first is distrust of the senses, which is actually an argument. He argues to the idiosyncratic distrust of the senses. And uh, the second is confusing the last and the first, and we'll say a couple of words about that. So, um, like I say, quick, quick, quick. Um, uh, the first of the idi idiosyncrasy starts with Nietzsche's claiming that um, the philosophers generally lack historical sense. That is, they practice a sort of Egyptism, they mummify their concepts, right? Um, generally, uh, the idea as a result of this concept mummification is that um, it, as the philosopher idolizes a concept, an idea, whether it be justice or virtue or piety or any of those what is X questions that Socrates or Plato were asking and trying to answer, what they do in their worship of the idea is they pin it, they stuff it, they mount it, they try to make it as eternal, as perfect as, as possible. And so Nietzsche claims on 479, death, change, old age, as well as procreation and growth are to their minds objections, even refutations. Whatever has being does not become. Whatever becomes does not have being. Now, <clears throat> now they all believe, desperately even, in what has being, but since they never grasp it, since they seek for reasons why it's kept for them, there must be <clears throat> mere appearance, there must be some deception, which uh, prevents us from perceiving that which, really, uh, which has being. Where's the deceiver? They, we found him, they cry ecstatically. It's our senses, these senses, which are so immoral in other ways too, deceive us concerning the true world. world moral. Let us free ourselves from the deception of the senses, uh, senses, from becoming, from history, from lies. History is nothing but faith in the senses, faith in lies. Moral. Let us say no to all who have faith in the senses, to all uh, the rest of mankind, they are mob. Let us be philosophers, let us be mummies, let us represent the monototheism by adopting the expression of a grave digger, and above all, away from the body, this wretched fixed idea, this wretched fixation of the senses, disfigured in all the fallacies of logic, refuted, uh, even impossible, although it's impudent enough to behave as though it were real. You see, what's going on here is that in searching for an answer to Socrates and Plato's what is X kind of questions, what we focuses on, uh, what philosophy focuses on is the universal, the perfect as the true, the unchanging, right? Truth must be true to me, true to you, true, true whether we think about it or not. And uh, true whether Socrates is contemplating the truth or I am contemplating the youth, even though there's thousands of years stretching between us. Right? So truth must be permanent. Problem is, everything that we perceive is in, as Heraclitus pointed out, and as Nietzsche will point out next, that Heraclitus, to a certain extent, had it right. In flux, everything is in a state of change. Right? So, the first idiosyncrasy of the philosophers is to distrust the senses, right? We distrust the senses, and along with the senses, we distrust the idea of a human being as an embodied being, as a physical being, etc., etc., right? And it, I should point out, judgments, judgments of value have no value in and of themselves except as symptoms, was the first move that Nietzsche made in this. What does it say to make a judgment about the senses? It, it, let's go back here. All right. um, let us free ourselves from the deceptions of, from becoming from history, from faith and lies. Uh, let us say no to all the faith in the senses, the rest of mankind, blah, blah, blah. The idea which 
the senses are tied to the body, the body is tied to passions, the passions are immoral, therefore the senses must be immoral as well. We saw this come out in Socrates, we saw this come out in Plato, right? Socrates turned to reason rather than our desires. Plato actually typified it in terms of his moral psychology, which, mind you, if you recall, all pertained to the soul and not to the body. The body was inessential. The body it has its deceptive senses and its passions that lead us to do stupid, foolish, wrong-headed kind of things. What, what does the body and its senses do? It leads us away from the truth of beauty and towards the expression of physical desires for gratification. We desire pleasure. We're immoral creatures. Why? Because we have the senses. What Nietzsche wants to argue is, to a certain extent, Heraclitus had it right. With the highest respect, I accept the name of Heraclitus. When the rest of philosophic folk were... Uh, uh, rejected the testimony of the senses because uh, they showed a mu multiplicity and change. He rejected their testimony because they showed that thing uh, showed things as if they had permanence and unity. Right. So Heraclitus provides sort of a limited exception, but remember that aspect of Heraclitus, uh, reason and language, logos. Heraclitus too actually expressed sort of a fascination for reason, right? Which, as we see, Nietzsche thinks that Heraclitus positioned in a, a wrong kind of way, right? Um, and then uh, this idiosyncrasy, he concludes by pointing out that, you know, we have science precisely to the extent that we trust the senses, have learned to think them through, have learned to hone them, that sort of thing. Think about all of our physical and observational sciences, those sciences that have been so productive, that have given us our technology, that have fostered our understanding of the natural world, etc., etc., etc. He's got um, it, this beautiful passage, I quite like it, um, uh, about the nose here, right? This nose, for example, which no philosopher has yet spoken with reverence and gratitude, is actually the most delicate instrument so far at our disposal. It's able to detect minimal differences in motion, which even a spectroscope cannot uh, detect. Today we possess science precisely to the extent to which we have decided to accept the testimony of the senses, to the extent to which we sharpen them, further arm them, and have learned to think them through. The rest is miscarriage and not yet science, in other words, metaphysics, theology, psychology, epistemology, or formal science, a doctrine of signs such as logic and that applied logic which is called mathematics. In them, reality is not encountered at all, not even as a problem, no more than the question of the value of such a sign convention of logic. So to the extent that we turn away from the evidence of experience, right, philosophy is idiosyncratic. Right? Why are we first asking the question why? Because we exist and we're trying to make sense of all of this stuff that presents itself to us. Well, Interestingly, our inferences have late led us directly away from all of this stuff that presents itself to us, presenting all experience as a deception. Right? Reality is fundamentally something other, claim people like Plato. Right? We never come across it in experience. Well, distrust of the senses is idio bloody syncratic, according to, according to this argument by Nietzsche. Okay, second idiosyncrasy, section 4, 481, the other idiosyncrasy of the philosophers is no less dangerous. It consists in confusing the last and the first. They place that which comes at the end, unfortunately, for it not, not, not come at all, namely the highest concepts, which means the most general, the emptiest concepts, the last smoke of evaporating reality in the beginning as the beginning. This, again, is nothing but their way of showing reverence. A hi uh, the higher way, or the higher may not grow out of the lower, may not have grown at all. Moral, whatever is of first rank must be self-caused. 
or, uh, origin out of something else is considered an, an objection, a question, uh, questioning value. The highest values are of first rank, the highest concepts, that which has, uh, that which has being. Un the unconditional, the good, the true, the perfect, all of these cannot have become and must therefore be self-caused. <clears throat> so what's Nietzsche getting at here? Well, you remember when I was teaching the theory of the forms, I started with uh, my particular cat and pointed out that the idea, catness, no, not ever Dean, uh, the idea, the form, the essence of cat, right, has like bloody none of the qualities that my cat has, right? Doesn't do tricks, isn't a black cat, isn't etc. 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 Right? So what Nietzsche's arguing is that largely what we've done is we've inverted the nature of truth. Our ideas are the least real. They're just sort of sloppy conceptual abstract ways of thinking about the things that we encounter. We have an idea of a thing. Why? Because we encounter the bloody thing. But rather than placing the concrete, rather than placing reality, rather than placing experience at as the locus, that which ideas are trying to wrap themselves around and become explanatory principles for, what we've done is we've turned the idea into the really real thing and the things that we experience are merely particular. They're the least real. Right? Now, effectively, what we've done in doing this is we've confused the last and the first. Right? So, the most real is that which is bloody well in front of us, and our concepts and abstractions and ideas come limping after to sort of wrap our minds around that which we experience. Right? We have confused more or less, our epistemology for reality. Right. So, what Nietzsche wants to further argue is that um, this God concept that we have is a symptom of this, well, these two idiosyncrasies. Uh, it, mostly the second, but these two idiosyncrasies. We distrust anything that changes, we distrust our experience, we distrust our senses, etc., etc., which leads us to believe that the most real is the idea of the thing rather than the particular thing. Well, in order to unite all of our ideas of the things, what we've needed to do is invent a heavenly realm of the perfect forms, and even the gods, according to Plato, were just nourished by these forms. Really, truth was one. We somehow wind up with an abstract notion of the perfect truth, which is being incarnate, which is one, which culturally then is passed down as one true God, right? So, effectively what Nietzsche has claimed is that our distrust of the senses and our confusion of the particular, the, 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 the reality of the particular being truly real only in the realm of ideas has led us to this unifying idea, right? They thus arrive at their stupendous concept, God, that which is last, thinnest, and emptiest is put first as the cause, right? as the most real being. Why did mankind have to take seriously the brain afflictions of sick web spinners? They paid dearly for it. Right? And um, he also points out that you know, largely this has a little bit to do with our use of language. Look at how we use language. Cat, dog, chair, coffee cup, lamp, right? it, it, justice. It, it, when we refer to things grammatically, we apply a certain degree of reality to these things. We speak in essences, even though we never encounter essences, right? Even though the things that we encounter that are supposed to be explained by these words, which are essences, are really particular bloody things, 
All right, so um, do 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 do. He concludes this funny little section, all right, um, by 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 stating reason and language. Oh, what a deceptive female she is! I'm afraid we're not uh, not rid of God because we still have faith and grammar. Uh, I should pause briefly with this deceptive female business. Um, I study with somebody um, at the PhD level and I actually really agree with her. She's a feminist that reads Nietzsche, which is sort of a strange thing because Nietzsche, you're going to find, says lots of disparaging things about women. I, like my professor, before I even met my professor, this was kind of my position, read Nietzsche's uh, sort of disdain for women as sort of a lament, a cultural lament. Most most of his criticisms are directed towards cultural belief and reality as we experience. Right? And if we think about Nietzsche, and mind you, everything Nietzsche wrote predates a transcontinental flight. Right? Nietzsche barely, barely conceived of a working light bulb. Right, the airplane was like new technology to Nietzsche. Right, so like, think of the state of women in the Germany of Nietzsche. Right, would they be educated? Would they be um, politically active subjects? Would they be considered social equals, or would they be uh, more like Nietzsche's family? dependents who tend to nitpick and attempt to control from a position of weakness. The women that Nietzsche encountered, just as they were embodied within the culture, tended to be just about everything Nietzsche is critical of. Think about his treatment of Socrates' resentment. Uh, Socrates was resentful because he had a will that failed to express itself as will and had to become dialectics instead, right, as a sort of imaginary revenge rather than a real expression of power. Now think of these subjugated women in Nietzsche's day, and what you would find is that since they were subjected, largely, I think, the natural reaction was to resent the fact that they have power that cannot be expressed as power. So what they would do is something resentful rather than... So Nietzsche's position regarding women, and mind you, Nietzsche's critical of Germans, of Russians, of Englishmen, of... Jewish people, of Americans, of just about every, of, of, of laborers, of, of, of philosophers, of priests, of, and I mean, his disdain is pretty universal. It's not just women he's picking on here, right? But every now and again, it comes through in his language, oh, what a deceptive female she is. Um, it's, it's, wouldn't fly in today's academic circles, and what's more, the state of women within culture has changed fundamentally too, so I don't think Nietzsche would be able to make the arguments that he makes here in descriptive terms, in metaphorical terms as they come through in his writings here. So, anyhow, back back, back to the passage that we're reading here. Reason and language, um, I'm afraid we're not rid of God because we still have faith in grammar. Interestingly, the language system that we actually engage with perpetuates a distrust of the senses and confusing the last and the first. It <coughs> speaks in terms of ideas, and these ideas, I mean, except insofar as language refers to anything, hey, look, that's a cat, or hi, I'm holding a book and sitting in a chair, that sort of thing. I clearly, in experience, mean this chair and this book, but if you did not see that, you would just conjure the abstract notion of chair, the abstract notion of book, all right? And that's what language does to reinforce these idiosyncrasies, all right? So that's reason in philosophy. Um, 